how do I think about making the transition from organizing my time and my work preferences and my ways of working as an individual to organizing our time and our ways of working as a team? This is Task Time Energy, the purpose-filled productivity podcast. I'm your host, Scott Miller. Welcome to the show. Welcome, everyone. Our guest today is Dan Gonzalez. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Scott. So happy to be here. For our listeners who don't know Dan, Dan studied engineering at Dartmouth College and then became a high school physics teacher. Later, Dan joined Manhattan Prep, a leading test preparation company, and Dan became president of Manhattan Prep in 2011. He was president of the company for over four years and led Manhattan Prep to achieve over 50% revenue growth and become the largest GMAT test prep provider in the world. So for people who don't know what the GMAT is, it's the graduate management admission test. It's the admission test to get into business school. Dan spent some time working as vice president of operations at Kaplan Test Prep and is now the CEO of District C. And Dan, I'm wondering if you would explain for our listeners what District C is and what you all do. Yeah, absolutely. So District C, we are trying to achieve one very important thing, and that is preparing the next generation of diverse talent for modern work. What we like to say is that the human job description of the modern economy is working with others to do really hard things, working with others to solve complex, novel problems. And so as we think about preparing the next generation for modern work, we're essentially wanting to prepare them to be great collective problem solvers. And, and we believe that any job across any industry in any sector, you are going to be successful in your work if you can work with others who think differently, bring different perspectives and backgrounds to do really hard things. And at least not yet, those kinds of things are not able to be automated away. And so that is really the, the scope of what we do at District C. We do it through a flagship program that we call Teamship, which you can think of as kind of a reimagined team-based internship where Teams of high school students work together to solve real problems for real businesses in the community. And they do that with the support of a certified expert educator. So, um, so yeah, that's District C and Teamship in a nutshell. District C is a nonprofit. We've been around for six plus years. We're based uh, here in North Carolina, just down the road from you. So and it's very fascinating. You're getting groups of, of high school students and you're basically training them to solve real world problems that actual companies in the area will bring to them. So companies will say, hey, we have this problem. We need a solution to this problem. And District C basically will organize groups of high school students to create a solution and then present their solution to these business owners. So they're actually doing a full on presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And what we have found, um, and this may not be surprising, but the thing that we have found that is the greatest motivator for students, imagine 16, 17 year olds, is the opportunity to do work that has the potential to add value to an organization, to a business, to that company's customers or clients. The fact that the work is real and meaningful is what motivates them to engage in the work. And I think we're, we're accustomed to more traditional educational models where there's a grade or a percentage at the end that is meant to be the motivator. And what we're finding through Teamship is that the, the authenticity of the work is, is the driver, which is really exciting. And so to your point, at the end, they get to present their thinking and their ideas and their proposals to real business people. And those business people often respond with, 
wow, we've never thought about our problem in this way. Or, oh my gosh, that, that potential solution is so interesting. I want to take this back to my team. Or we're going to start thinking about this on Monday. And that validation and that feedback has, has just been really, really powerful. Of course, it doesn't end up that way all the time. Sometimes uh, the solutions aren't on point, but that's that's real life, right? That happens in all of our professional work as well. Um, sometimes you do some hard thinking and some, and, and you work hard in a committed way and you don't get to that, that final outcome. And in those cases, those are great lessons for the professional world as well. Do the students that you're working with get some type of credit for this work that they're doing with District C, some kind of school credit for that? Yeah, great question. So the primary mode of implementation is that we train educators to be teamship coaches, and then we support them in implementing teamship for their students, either in their classes or as a new class at their school. So oftentimes, I would say the majority of times when students are doing teamship, they're doing it for, for credit at their school. I mean, that's not, it's not always the case. Sometimes we deliver direct teamship programs in, during after school hours. But the reason for this is that we know that primarily students with social capital and family networks tend to get the bulk of the meaningful work-based learning opportunities that exist in the world. So take a summer internship. If mom is vice president at XYZ company and XYZ company is offering a summer internship, it's very likely that mom's son is going to get that internship, right? Because of connections and social capital. What we want to do is try to bring robust, meaningful work-based learning to students where they are, and that is at school during the school day, so that if a student doesn't have access to those kinds of connections, or if a student needs to be taking care of siblings or grandparents after school, and they uh, would miss out on these opportunities otherwise, we can provide this for them during school and at school. So there's there's kind of an equity perspective to this to this work as well, which we believe in. That's excellent. I'm wondering if you can share some statistics about where District C is right now in terms of you know the number of students you've served or you know other statistics like that, just to give uh, people an idea of the scope of the organization. Yeah, so we have reached over three thousand students. The exciting part is we've reached over 3,000 students in six plus years. This summer alone, we will reach a new uh, crop of over 1,000 students. So we're really uh, growing quickly, which is really fun and exciting. We've trained and certified uh, just under 200 educators at this point. Um, I think it's probably in the 180 range. We have partnerships with uh, over 50 schools and school districts. Uh, that we work with that have adopted Teamship for their students. And our work is now happening in six or seven states across the country, primarily here in North Carolina, but increasingly in other parts of the country, which is which is really fun. Uh, again, new challenges come with that growth. <laughs> We're, again, we have a lot of stuff to figure out, but that that's that's the journey. That's what the work is. No, it's excellent. It's excellent to hear how how much your reach is extending now. I'm curious about the kind of students who are interested in doing this and are they the the kids who like have already decided that they want to go to business school and be entrepreneurs or do you get a, a kind of a wide range or a, in any way a surprising range of students that are interested in the program? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting kind of paying attention to the trends on this front. The, sometimes we have students that will say I'm not sure I should do this because I don't know anything about business, or I'm not sure I should do this because I don't want to start my own business. And our, our response typically is, well, look, this is about learning how to, how to understand other people's perspectives. It's learning how to work with others in a productive way. It's learning how to use your time wisely. It's learning how to break down hard problems into their component parts. It's learning how to tap into the depths of your creativity. It's learning how to speak in front of others. That's really less about business than it is about being a productive member of your community. And that's that's in, important in any context. And so I think once we present it that way, it tends to break down those kind of self-imposed barriers or constraints. 
The other thing I would say is, I, you know, I think a lot of people assume a program like this, you're going to get the successful academic students who who would opt into this program. And that does happen, but this program is for any student who is committed to exploring and deepening their skills in a new context. The really exciting part about this is you might have like an average student relative to traditional school measures or norms, you know, average academic student who in a teamship program discovers a new voice that they have or discovers a skill that they never knew that they had within them. And they thrive in this environment in a way that maybe they haven't in a typical school environment. So just because you have learned how to be good at the game of school doesn't necessarily mean you are uniquely suited for this experience. In fact, those who have learned to be good at the game of school often have to unlearn some of those things to be a great team-based problem solver. So it's really for any student who's committed to engaging in, in something new and exciting. That's an interesting facet of it because I could see how some people would just look quickly at District C and think the focus is all on business and preparing, you know, the business leaders of the future. And yet, yeah, you can see how when you're looking at the actual work that the students are doing and what they're learning, there are so many dimensions of it of creativity and problem solving and communication and collaboration and so many skills that are going to be valuable for these students no matter what they choose to do with their life. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, the business problem is really just the context for the work. Learning to be a great team-based problem solver, you know, uh, you know as we talked about earlier, you, you're gonna that's gonna be required of you in whatever context you're you're working in the future. Could you tell us a little bit about how District C got started, how the idea came about, and and how you started the organization, and and just a little bit of that background story? Yeah, so um, District C was co-founded by me and and my wife actually. So we we started this thing together back in kind of summer of 2016. We decided we were ready for kind of a new new journey adventure in our professional lives and we decided to start this thing together. So we both left our jobs and and my wife spent about 3 months just like doing a deep dive into career-based education, what were the trends, what were the opportunities? I think we knew we wanted to do something to to prepare students for real work, and we didn't quite know what the what the program offering was going to be. But she did a bunch of research. Then we came together and started to think about okay, how do we how do we wrangle up some students here and actually try some things? And so we kind of started just by doing it. We didn't really have a business model. We didn't have a sense for how we would like generate revenue doing this. We didn't have a sense for kind of the operational structure. We did decide, I think it was a, a good decision early on, let's just get some students and let's let's put them through some kind of an experience. So once we had the students, we knew we had to design something. So we designed it and, and we did it. So it was kind of just a loose a, a loose idea. We wanted to start something ourselves. We wanted it to prepare students for work. And we just started started like getting after it and doing it and learned a ton, made a ton of mistakes. And that's just kind of been the mindset since. It makes me think of a theme that comes up very often when we're talking to people on this podcast, which is how the quest for perfection can get in the way of progress. And it sounds like you all were willing to do this just with what you had in the moment without worrying about everything being lined up perfectly the way that might be ideal. And you're ready to just dive in and get your hands dirty. Is that like, am I hearing that accurately? You are. And I have to admit, Scott, that that was really, that was really hard for me. I am typically someone who doesn't want, like if I'm working on something, I don't want to show anyone until I feel like I've got it 100% where I want it. Right. And so, um, you know, I think, Anne and I were a good balance for each other in that way. She kept pushing, you know, let's just get it out there. And I kind of wanted a little more clarity in terms of what the direction was, what the scope would be. But ultimately, you know, again, I think it was a wise decision. It took and has continued to take some pretty active, like change in mindset for me in particular, because I do have a little bit of a like try to make it perfect approach to things generally in my life. So this. I think starting starting an organization, being an entrepreneur has really helped me grow in this way. And it's, I think, been a really important kind of process of self-discovery and learning for me personally. 
when talking to people who are entrepreneurs, when talking to people who have founded a company and thinking about all the demands that that would place on your time, you end up wearing a lot of hats and you have a lot of demands pulling you in different directions. So you mentioned that you know the the willingness to let go of perfection has been one challenge for you. What are some of the other challenges that you've had to face in this role with District C and maybe some of the ways that you've been able to manage those challenges? Does anything come to mind? Yeah. Um, yes. So as I mentioned, we're kind of six, six and a half years into this at this point. I think one of the challenges is that the challenges change so rapidly. And if you're doing well, the organization like evolves in real time. Um, the work evolves, the opportunities evolve, the kinds of things that you're doing every day evolve. And, you know, I think in a normal career where you're, you know, working for a steady, stable organization, you know, your job changes, but it changes every two to three years, you know, and you kind of have some time to settle into like, okay, this is what I do every day. When I wake up, I do these four things and I talk to these three people. You know, I think the big learning for us has been with a startup nonprofit or for-profit, the work just changes so quickly. So the things that you were doing three weeks ago might be totally different than the stuff you're focused on today. The priorities might change. And so that, that's that been, I think, a fun challenge because I personally enjoy that pace of evolution. It makes things fresh. It makes stuff exciting. So, but it's it doesn't mean that it's easy because, you know, as one person, you only have like so many strengths in so many areas of expertise. And so you kind of have to just roll with it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fun, but it is, it has been a learning experience for sure. You talked a little bit about how, Anne is you two work together well as a team because of maybe some of your different aptitudes or different ways to approach things. And it seems like the District C team has been growing kind of steadily. I'm wondering how much of a role that played in your ability to manage your time. Um, are you somebody who just finds it easy to delegate and hand things off to other people as you bring them on the team? Or has that been any kind of a struggle for you? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, starting with Anne and me specifically, one of the things that we kind of realized early on is that we both had, we, we had different kind of centers of gravity. So the the kind of stuff that she wanted to be working on was different from the kind of stuff that I wanted to be working on. And those things, those preferences were pretty much aligned with our different like skill sets and strengths. And so I think it would have been really difficult for us had those things overlapped to a significant degree, but they just kind of naturally fell into different, different piles, right? And so one quick example is if we were needing to build something new, say a new element to the program, she loves the like the blank slate, the, the the empty canvas, the like hacking through the brush with the machete. And so she's able to come back with kind of this roughly formed kind of thing or idea. And that and, and that's a real strength for her to kind of create something from nothing. I think a strength of mine is to take something that is kind of half formed and like refine it, chisel it, um, shape it into something that is then the deliverable, right? And so I think we both, you know, have strengths in both areas, but I think prefer those different kind of categories of work. And so we just naturally, like if something's new, she'll grab it for a couple of weeks and she'll come back and say, hey, here's where I've got it. And then I can pick it up from there and then and then shape it. So we had that kind of natural um, kind of division. I would say as we've added team members, that's been a really fun part of the work because the work for us has evolved into supporting new team members and recognizing the strengths that they bring and then thinking about how that should then change the things that we're doing as co-founders, right? And, and that, again, is like I mentioned, this, this work evolves over time. And I think that's where we are at the moment is really enjoying having phenomenal members on the team and helping them thrive and grow and seeing how our roles are evolving kind of simultaneously as, as they take on more and more of, of the organization. When you look at students, different students who are coming through your program or different students that you're interacting with, 
What are some of the challenges that you see students having just in terms of learning to organize their work, learning to organize their time? Um, is that anything that you encounter in, in the work that you're doing? Yeah, such a good question. I think the biggest transition for students is how do I think about making the transition from organizing my time and my work preferences and my ways of working as an individual to organizing our time and our ways of working as a team? And I think the key to that is understanding that if you and I are working on a team, Scott, the way that I track my work might be different from the way that you track your work. The way that I think about deadlines might be different from the way that you think about deadlines. And so in order to be a productive team, you really have to come to some agreement about how you want to manage your work as a group. And I think the first thing you've got to do to do that well is you have to get to know your teammates and you have to understand your teammates. You have to understand their strengths, their preferences, their preferred ways of working. And so we start off from the beginning with try, trying to kind of imprint that mindset on, on our students, which is, okay, you're sitting across the table from three teammates. You know nothing about them. You don't really even know what their names are. How are you going to invest in them such that you come away with a really deep understanding of what makes them tick, how they work, how they prefer to manage their time, how they prefer to track their documents, how they think about the world, you know, so that you can then collectively make some decisions about how you're going to do this work together, right? And we en end up with students having a set of kind of team, we call them team commitments. But the first part is learning how to invest in other people. The, the game of school typically is an individual endeavor, right? It's about, it's about my attendance. It's about my grade. It's about my completion record. It's about my diploma. If I don't show up for a math class, no one really cares because my performance doesn't impact anyone else. In a team-based problem-solving setting, your performance really impacts your teammates, and it impacts the final result and, the, and the, the, the level of productivity that you're striving for. So I think that is the biggest thing, is investing in others to understand them at a level that you can then take and, and think about, how are we going to do this stuff together as a team? That's probably the biggest transition that we see, and and that's the area that we focus on the most, at least initially. That seems so valuable as you're saying that, because I'm just thinking from my own perspective of making that shift from thinking, okay, this is how I like to do things, this is how I want to do things, this is how this is what makes me productive, and wondering why everybody else in the world doesn't just do things the way I do them, just to make things easy, right? Making the shift from that to saying, okay, now I'm part of a team. And other people have very valid ways of looking at things and equally valid preferences and making that shift. And I'm thinking, well, how old was I when I started making that shift? And it wasn't in high school. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that you're teaching people how to do that at such a young age is amazing. So one of the things that we often hear, I mean, maybe, I don't know how I, I, this is, I have no idea how common this is, but you do occasionally hear people talk about group projects in school, whether it's at a high school level or a college level. And a lot of people aren't really fond of group projects, and maybe it's just because of the particular experiences they've had. But I'm wondering, do you face any challenges in that area of people having some maybe uh, preconceived ideas about group work and how much they're going to like it? Or is it just not an issue because of the nature of, of what District C is doing? Most students that we talk to come into the program having had some very bad experiences working with others, right? Right. And I think you, you probably remember back to your school days. This is what it was like for me. You're on a team. Maybe you're doing a science lab together or a report together. And what typically ends up happening is there are four people on the team. There are four sections to the report. So you divide them up and you say, you go do part A, I'll do part B, you do part C, you do part D. And then you got to get it done by a certain time. Typically that time comes and maybe one or two of the people have done their parts. The other two haven't done their parts. And so one of the people just decides to take on the parts that aren't done, right? And so that person ends up resenting the others for not completing it. 
The others end up resenting that person because, you know, I knew you were going to take my part from the beginning anyway. You always do. You're that kind of student. And it just leads to a lot of resentment and bad, bad feelings, right? And so uh, another like really core aspect to teamship is and, and this idea of investing in others and investing in others' differences, investing in the different ways that other people come up with ideas and think about the world is if you can leverage the diversity that you have on your team. And if you can process the, the different perspectives that people bring and combine them, you will create something. It's like, you know, it's the one plus one equals three phenomenon. Like if you can do it together and you can really arrive at some kind of collective intelligence about the problem, you will create something better than the sum of the parts. And so the hope is that students leave the teamship experience realizing, oh, when I really take the time to invest in Scott and his ideas and perspectives, that makes my thinking better. And oh my gosh, we can create something better than just like dividing and conquering. So it's this idea of collective intelligence that we're after. It doesn't always work, but by the end, generally speaking, the students are thinking I'm better at teamwork. I understand how to do it now, and I understand the value of different perspectives. So that that's really the goal behind it. Yeah, that's really an interesting shift because you can see as you're saying that, you can see how very often we look at teamwork or group projects as divide and conquer. We're actually just four individuals doing our individual parts. And even though we happen to put it all together at the end into one thing, it really is a bunch of individuals and they're going their individual ways. Whereas what you're talking about is really making it a true group effort, a true collaborative effort where we're actually learning from each other. People are actually learning from each other and learning how to combine their skills with other people's skills. Yeah. And the thing about it is if you were just to tell a student to do that, or even tell an adult to do that, it's not abundantly clear like how I should change my behavior to make that happen. Like the natural instinct is let's cut this thing up, divide and conquer, and let's just like get it done. It's not clear how to do it any other way, right? And so part of what we try to do is take that abstraction of, hey, team, build some collective intelligence, do this together. Okay, great. I don't know what that means. How do I do that? That's an abstraction. How do we take that abstraction and make it actionable. And the way that we make it actionable is by coaching students on really discrete, we call them tools. They're really ways of working and protocols for interacting with each other that help you leverage the perspectives of others. So for example, we might decide like, ooh, this is a really meaty challenge. How do we better understand this challenge? Instead of me saying, hey, Scott, why don't you go, like, that's your part of the job. You go think about this challenge and this problem, what's at the root of it. We might decide to take 10 minutes of solo time. We call it solo flight. Take notes in a shared document so that the work is visible to everyone on the team. Come back and for five minutes at a time, just question each of our teammates. So we would spend five minutes just investigating your thinking on that problem as we're taking notes in that shared document. Once we're done with the five minutes, we go on to the next team member and invest five minutes in that person's thinking. So the solo time allows us to get our own individual thinking out. That round robin of questioning, which we call a take five, allows us to invest in others' thinking and, and generate some kind of collective understanding of each other's thinking in a shared document format. And we come out of that with a different level of understanding of the problem, right? So those tools are actionable behaviors that allow you to develop the collective intelligence rather than just talking about it in kind of an abstract way. So that is that was one of the early kind of discoveries we made is we had to get away from the abstractions and coach on really discrete, actionable tools. Yeah, I can see how that structure you know, as is often the case, a certain amount of structure actually promotes creativity and collaboration, right? We often think it's the other opposite way around that creativity comes from just complete freedom of thought. But actually, when we add some structure, some scaffold to build on, it becomes so much more effective. It sounds like with this process that you're describing, people have the opportunity to collect their own thoughts. And then everybody knows that they're going to have their five minutes to talk with other people listening. 
and it gets away from the problems we often have in meetings where everybody just is sitting there waiting for their turn to talk, right? And like, well, well you know, I don't, I'm not going to listen to what Dan's saying because I'm just thinking about what I'm going to say. And it's separating it out like that and creating that structure overcomes those tendencies that create issues in the way we normally do things. But you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly it. It's about equity of voice. And we all know that there are dominant voices on teams and there are less dominant voices on teams. By creating the structure, you create an opportunity for all voices to be included and heard. The solo time at the beginning is meant to recognize and acknowledge that those who consider themselves introverts do their best thinking and this is from Susan Kane's work on, on, on introverts, do their best thinking in what she calls solo flights of thought. So if I'm an introvert, which I am, I would really prefer to have 10 minutes to think about this problem before we start talking about it. Because I won't have my thoughts fully formed if we just like get into a popcorn style conversation. So, hey team, how about we take 10 minutes of solo flight, let me think about it, and then I'll be prepared to answer your questions about my thinking. And I'll be prepared to ask you questions about your thinking. So you can start to see these tools as building blocks that you stack together. So solo flight plus take five for each member of the team, plus the questioning tool. And you start to arrive at ways of working together that build collective intelligence. I love the topic of this podcast, Time Management, and it's, it's, it's really relevant here because I think initially what participants, what students will think is, I don't want to invest all that time in doing all that stuff that takes too long. But if you do invest in it, you get much more efficient later on and you're able to optimize the work, the quality of the work and the, and the efficiency of the work that you're doing together as a team. These tools, this, this way of working is great for 16 and 17 year olds. We often have educators that go through the experience and say, I want to take this to my staff meetings. <laughs> you know, I think we can, we can really optimize our team performance in an adult setting by doing some of this as well. They're really simple things. They're really simple actions and behaviors, but it, it's about managing your time in a way that is going to optimize the productivity of that time. Yeah, that is such a uh, a common thing, a common hesitation that people seem to have when you say, well, let's just take five minutes in advance to think about, you know, collect our thoughts or write our own notes. The, uh, there seems to be such a natural reaction to that of thinking, well, you know, that's just wasting. We don't have time to do that. Sometimes slowing down and taking that little bit of extra time to prepare or do things in a little more structured way. There's always that little impatient part of us that thinks, you know, I don't have time to do this. And yet when we step back and look at it objectively, we recognize that we're actually being much more effective, much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is excellent, Dan. Um, there's so much more that we could talk about, but I'd love to ask you a question that I ask everyone at the end of these podcast episodes, which is what is your dream right now? Oh my gosh. Um, what is my dream right now? I would say, and this is obviously related to the work that we do at District C, my dream or purpose, you know, even beyond the work that we're doing as students, I would love for good people to feel like they have meaningful work in their lives. And, you know, good people, I think those that are motivated by positive intentions, those that see themselves as part of a broader community. I, I, I would hope for those people that they feel like they are, they're waking up every day and, and, and feeling inspired and motivated by the work that they're doing, that there's purpose in their work, that there is value in their work. That um, And this goes back to something we were talking about offline before we started recording, uh, which is that people feel productive, they've been productive at the end of the day, that they've done work that matters. I mean, work consumes so much of our, so like such a high percentage of our, of our time. And I, I have to believe that there's a positive correlation between people that are happy with their work and feel like they have meaning and purpose in it. And those that feel like they are happy in their lives. I think those th two things go hand in hand. And so I've been thinking a lot about that recently, uh, obviously related in some ways to District C, but uh, just related to 
uh, things generally, uh, meaningful work for good people. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank, I love that question. Uh, I had to think about that. If people would like to learn more about District C and what you're doing, where would they uh, where would they go to learn more? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. They can go to districtc.co, districtc.co. There's a contact form. You can contact us. And we're always interested in hearing from people who have good ideas about this work. Or we're just generally interested in it. And I really appreciate, Scott, you inviting me on to have this conversation. Yeah, it means a lot. Anything else you'd like to share before we call it a day? No, just to appreciate knowing you for, for many years now. You're great at hosting this podcast. Good good questioner. And um, yeah, I, I just uh, think very highly of your work and glad we have this conversation. Yeah, same here. I'm really excited about the work that District C is doing. I always enjoy hearing what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I think it's fantastic. It's a fantastic project. So thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, likewise. I'll include a link to the District C website in the show notes so you can go check out their website, check out the latest news and events, and learn more about their teamship program. As Dan said, they are always interested in hearing from people who have ideas that they want to share or people who are interested in what District C is doing. So go check out the District C website. I would also love for you to visit my website, scottmillercoaching.com. I'm offering free one-hour online time management workshops called Task, Time, Energy, The Workshop. I'm doing these once a month. And if you go to my website, scottmillercoaching.com, you'll find a link that you can use to register for the next workshop. Love to see you there. Remember to click that like button or subscribe button or follow button or whatever it's called on your podcast player. We'd love to have you come back and join us for another episode of the podcast. And until then, thanks for joining us today and take care.